Um, welcome everyone. I'm Shep Steiner, Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Theory at the University of Manitoba and editor of the journal Mosaic. I want to welcome you to the lecture series Relative Time, Little Time that the Dutch artist team, um, Vic van der Paul, developed in collaboration with our journal. Before I thank our sponsors and introduce our speaker, Dominique Petman, I want to acknowledge the traditional land on which the University of Manitoba campuses are located, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you to our sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the University of Manitoba Conference Sponsorship Program, and lastly, the Faculty of Arts, the School of Art, and the Institute for the Humanities, all at the University of Manitoba. We will have a question period at the end of the lecture, and Dominique has um, agreed to um, entertain us with his answers. And please realize you will be recorded. Your consent is appreciated. My co-host, Carolyn DeCorno, Mosaic's managing editor, or Timothy Brown, our conference assistant, will unmute you. It is always appreciated if you can ask your camera, uh, your questions with cameras on, but not necessary. Lastly, I remind you that our next lecture is tomorrow, February 4 at 1 p.m. with Stephen Duval and Marina McDougall. Now to welcome our invited speaker, Dr. Dominique Petman, who is Professor of Media and New Humanities at the New School of Social Research in New York. His many, many books include After the Orgy, Toward a Politics of Exhaustion from 2002, Avoiding the Subject, Media, Culture, and the Object with Justin Clemens from 2004, Love and Other Technologies, Retrofitting Eros for the Information Age from 2006, Human Error, Species Being and Media Machines from 2011, Look at the Bunny, Totem, Taboo, Technology from 2013, I've read part of that one, In Divisible Cities from 2013, Infinite Distraction from 2015, Humid, All Too Humid from 2016, Sonic Intimacy, Voice, Species, Technics, Creaturely Love from 2017, Meta Gestures with Carla Nappi from 2019, and finally from 2020, Peak Libido, Sex, Ecology, and the Collapse of Desire, a great book. His lecture today is titled The Observational Eros, Time, Libido, and the Attention Ecology. Please welcome Dr. Dominique Petman. Unmuted, unmuted. Thanks so much, uh, Shep, uh, for this generous introduction and invitation. Um, it's really lovely to be here in this nowhere. Um, thanks to Vic van der Poel as well and Timothy for all your help. Um, and thanks all to everyone here. I, I'm going to be talking about attention a little bit and obviously the attention economy is fierce as well as exhaustion, which is another theme that will probably come up. So um, I really appreciate uh, folks taking the time today. Um, it, I'll be doing an attempt to connect some of my recent projects into a new diagram. Um, so this is an experiment in progress. Uh, for over 25 years now, it's just signaled I've been writing about the relationship between love, desire, and technology. And more recently, I've been interested in adding the key terms of ecology and attention to the mix, um, including the ecology of attention, as Yves Citon would say. So for the purposes of today's talk, however, I've also dry, dropped in that ever effervescent key term time into the cocktail to see what happens, given that's the theme of the series. Um, 
Part one, I will riff a little bit around peak libido, um, this concept I explore in my most recent book in relation to uh, Jenny O'Dell's concept of observational eros. Um, so if, if you are familiar with my book, I'm, uh, apologies for if it's a few over familiar ideas mixed in here. Um, but part two, I'll be um, walking through, well, I'll be surfing a bit. I'm surfing around the, the act of surfing, um, which was part of a new project. And I'll, I'll, so that will be new to people, um, including myself. So this, yeah, so part one, peak libido or time is out of joy. Love, and this is, I guess, apropos as we approach Valentine's Day, love takes time to flourish, or it can arrive with a flash seemingly fully formed. Certainly, it is difficult to know where to begin when it comes to romantic or erotic temporality other than the conviction that desire makes the sense of time more urgent, more intense, more keenly felt. Indeed, Proust spent 3,000 pages demonstrating that the passion we call love is so entangled with the passage of time that its substance can hardly be considered distinct from it. An observation Joanna Newsom distilled into a lyrical couplet Love is not a symptom of time, but time is a symptom of loving. The classical Mediterranean world through its philosophers and poets seem to appreciate the generating animating power of love, citing Eros as the force which brought light and motion into being at the beginning of the universe before drawing cosmic bodies toward each other from the scale of the stars and planets down to the level of the humans, birds, bees, and even atoms. An understanding of Eros that essentially persists up to and beyond Freud in the collective mythos. Lovers, so to say, never have enough time or else they have too much of the wrong kind of time, i.e. spent without the beloved. Lovers are acutely, exquisitely, painfully aware of how quickly time passes in the presence of each other or how slowly it passes when apart. As such, the lovers seek to inhabit a world bewitched by Zeno's famous paradox in which an arrow approaches its target, but due to metric contradictions inscribed within the heart of metaphysics, never completes the journey. To not only fall in love, but to tarry there, this is Zeno's impossible paradise. If for the sake of some Germanic practicality, we borrow Nicholas Luhmann's definition of love, we can consider it to be a discursive result of the codification of intimacy. And further, if we admit that this passion has evolved through several different codes over the centuries, from classical to courtly, to romantic to modern and so on, we must acknowledge that love in our own era suffers from a time famine a tempor or temporal crisis. Since our personal relationships are necessarily framed and structured by public forms and institutions, especially in terms of our own labor, then love has increasingly, to use a colloquial Australian term, received the rough end of the pineapple. The population is increasingly divided into those with no time for themselves, working two or three jobs just to make ends meet, and those with too much time on their hands, thanks to either obscene wealth or more commonly due to un or underemployment. The majority of my students, for instance, deny any sense of stigma in using dating apps since they value the efficiency that such technology brings to their busy schedules. Like the rest of us, it seems, love is now obliged to submit to the almighty neoliberal God of convenience. Okay, Cupid, click here to accept the terms of use. While some may see a return to the epistolary romance in contemporary flirtation via texting, this is not simply a digital upgrade of a traditional custom, since it contends with new pressures and contexts in terms of self-presentation, expression, protocols, pacing, and so on. 
In other words, our media ecology encourages speed, fickleness, capriciousness, and multitasking. To the extent where I suspect polyamory is on the rise, less as an ethical response to the tyranny of compulsory monogamy, but as a consumerist embrace of the need for choice, options, novelty, and personalized customizations. The French philosopher Bernard Stiegler noticed something important when he diagnosed a condition that I have since summarized as peak libido. For Stiegler, we are as a species rapidly running out of this crucial human resource, libido, which he defines rather idiosyncratically as the capacity to love and to care for the other over time. Instead, we are seeing the rapacious uh, rise of what he calls sheer drive in the age of instant gratification. That is the desire to possess, to consume and move on. Eroticized monetized drive is part of a wider culture, cat, cultural cataclysm, namely the disruption of the intergenerational apprenticeship in learning and relearning how to live. The long loops of knowledge transmission dedicated to instructing all of us how to be a person among people has, according to Stiegler, been broken or lost. We have forgotten the delicate art of living and especially the art of living together due to the disorienting and disruptive effects of technology specifically designed to further the alienating effects of capital. So to say, Stiegler is not anti-technology per se, uh, but vigorously against the overdetermined design and deployment of techniques for inhuman ends, such as obscene profits and biopolitical control. Thus, for example, we have forgotten the art of eating just as we have forgotten the art of love. Instead, we shovel food into our mouths, and pour it into our eyes between Zoom meetings. And a large part of this crisis comes down to a lack of time on the one hand and an inability to inhabit time when we are fortunate to be granted a surplus of it. Time thus becomes like those dead zones in the ocean in which we can snorkel through but find no life or vitality within. Instead, we try to fill it with Netflix, Twitter, or TikTok. The latter being a perfect name for an app which performs the magic trick of making time disappear. Time for Stiegler has become almost irredeemably industrialized, a byproduct of intricate, ingenious, and all-encompassing commercial arrangements. Where Frederick Winslow Taylor parceled time into measurable units, for the purposes of enhanced scientific management of the workday, recent descendants of the same impulse have learned to colonize and canalize not only the public movements of the factory, but the physiological, cognitive, and emotional instincts and interfaces of our most intimate selves. Indeed, it may not be long before any distinction between time proper and time on device is moot. That is, if Silicon Valley has its way, and we are all auto-fitted with augmentation lenses to access the cloud or metaverse 24-7. As such, I fully expect a new Martin Heidegger to write, to write a revised ontology, being and screen time. The first thing power does is install a rhythm, or so claims Roland Barthes. And over the centuries, power has learned to do this through the most exquisite, unconscious, and ambient techniques. Today we are, in Stiegler's word, words, being hypersynchronized by the corporate topology and protocols of the internet, so that we are obsessed with our own individuality, even as we double down on our profound generic aspect, what the kids call basic, a social ontology of whateverness. In Stiegler's view, there is no time available for re real or true love to flourish in the age of technical psychopower, because there is no time left that we can truly call our own. I'm certainly not the first to observe that our so-called leisure time is usually spent donating our free hours to maximizing the profits of Netflix, Facebook, Spotify, Apple, Disney, and so on. Our free time has morphed into emotional or emotionless labor. 
under these conditions, even the heart has become an accelerationist, as opposed to the genitals, which perhaps always were. And yet the ongoing goes on without actually going anywhere. It remains to be seen whether the pandemic will complicate or merely confirm this rather bleak analysis. Certainly we are aware of a general sense that love or intimacy is even more remote, abstract and difficult to access in the age of extended and now perhaps even chronic and voluntary lockdown. Sadly, nature doesn't seem to be healing despite the economic slowdown and I suspect the same applies to the libido. We hoped for a Dionysian summer of joy in the middle of 2021 after the arrival of vaccinations. But apart from a few weeks, especially for the young and the reckless, it was not to be so. To be sure, it is still too early to really say how the pandemic will affect the collective libido in the longer term. For now, however, we can emphasize the obvious fact that sex and intimacy is increasingly mediated. Witness, for instance, the explosion of OnlyFans, a site in which people, especially young women, can sell subscriptions to their sexual capital online. At present, we are, applied, we are obliged to be patient and creative, making the most of the technologies to hand. It could indeed be a silver lining here in terms of finding and fabricating new forms of intimacy, new types of courtship, new sublimations in the interest of new pleasures a bit further down the line. Perhaps we won't take such an Amazon Prime approach to sex where we expect satisfaction to be delivered to our doorstep within 24 hours. Indeed, for too long we have dovetailed our desires with neoliberal imperatives, adapting a just-in-time delivery model for the libido. But today the romantic supply chains are broken. The sexual canals are blocked. In response, perhaps we'll see a slow love movement growing akin to the slow food movement. Perhaps we'll witness a less consumerist anti-instant gratification approach to the libido. In any case, during the pandemic, unless we found ourselves lucky enough to be locked down with a partner in the negentropic phase of the relationship, then we were obliged to cultivate an erotics of suspension, either with someone elsewhere or simply with ourselves. And autoeroticism is surely one of the most common forms of eros these days. With any luck, this extended liminal moment will lead to a reappreciation of the ars erotica that Foucault preferred to the scientia sexualis, or to a new respect for Baudrillard's unusual understanding of seduction over the lonely, passive aggressive phantasms of romantic love. In practice, however, we are more likely to succumb to simply waiting, frustration, and many of the other negative affects, sad passions, and disingenuously ingenious forms of cruel optimism. After all, as I remind the reader in my book, Creaturely Love, we are still mammals who crave the touch of other warm-blooded creatures. Some ethnographers of dating apps, including Anya Malinowska, who I don't, yeah, there she is, hi Anya, um, who has a brand new book on love and technoculture, um, has described Tinder and its ilk as unsustainable. Whether this is true or not, whether we have truly reached peak libido in the sense of fully instrumentalizing ourselves and gaming each other remains to be seen. But the question of sustainability and the relation between the libidinal economy and libidinal ecology becomes increasingly visible and increasingly vital in the age of the Anthropocene and within a world system that seems to be rapidly collapsing and rapidly intensifying at one and the same time, leaving little time or space for anything beyond desire as a rote form of organic mechanics. So again, we must relearn the art of living and especially the art of living together in ways that honor, encourage and nourish what Charles Fourier understood in his capacity as a pioneering libidinal ecologist, as an essentially collective yet still intimate passionate attraction. It's easy to get into the semantic weeds when it comes to love, 
since this is more a meta concept or structural organizing principle than a simple noun or verb. It has many kindred terms, several of which I've already evoked, desire, intimacy, eros, passion, romance, and so on. The Venn diagram around love is super complex since we need to account for different histories, cultures, subcultures, traditions, time periods, and so on. Love is the ultimate palimpsest and the heaviest of floating signifiers, weighed down by centuries of expectations. Trojan horses, hypocrisies, misunderstandings, and disastrous blind dates. Nevertheless, today I'd like to offer one further synonym at the risk of breaking this remarkably resilient camel's back, and that term is attention. Certainly, there can be nothing approximating love if there is no close attention paid to the beloved. Love seems to command a monomaniacal form of attention and vice versa. They are mutually sustaining for as long as Saturn himself decides enough is enough. Why did I put Saturn there? Hmm. Interesting. Um, for love dies and affection and habit takes its place to, qu to quote obscure 90s pop band, The Golden Palominos. You know that one, Greg? Yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> But what if the part of the problem of peak libido is the relentless focus on the couple or intersubjectivity itself? What if eros has been so reduced and refined in our meta-romantic age that we have lost touch with the context and conditions that allow for the creation of love in the first place? Perhaps we've concentrated so much on libidinal economics that we have destroyed the libidinal ecology that sustains and nourishes it. In her popular and timely book, How to Do Nothing, Jenny O'Dell urges the reader to resist the attention economy. That is, she counsels opting out of the mobile mediascape that has turned us all into digital squirrels for a quieter, deeper, slower form of attention. A simple refusal motivates my argument, O'Dell writes. Refusal to believe that the present time and place and the people who are here with us are somehow not enough. Platforms such as Facebook and Instagram act like dams that capitalize on our natural interest in others and an ageless need for community, hijacking and frustrating our most innate desires and profiting from them. In other words, Odell is not really encouraging us to do nothing since we already do too much of that, even as we scroll and click and post and like. Rather, she is reminding us that we would much prefer to do non-monetizable things like simply notice our surroundings, a radical act these days with nothing simple about it. Later in the book, Odell briefly introduces her, nation, her notion of the observational eros, which she describes as a near paralyzing fascination with one subject of attention. Her first example is both literary and ecological from Steinbeck's novella Cannery Row, where the narrator describes the patience and care involved in close observations of one's specimens. Quote, when you collect marine animals, there are certain flatworms so delicate that they are almost impossible to capture whole for they break and tatter under the touch. You must let them ooze and crawl out of their own will onto a knife blade and then lift them gently into your bottle of seawater. Of course, observational eros need not be visual or empirical, but can and probably should involve different pathways and calibrations of our senses. It is not the cold libidinal thrill of scientific witnessing, but closer to the warm and intimate haptics of Pauline Oliveros's deep listening or the type of attention holding architecture, another phrase of Odell's that encourages sustained contemplation. Indeed, I'm not sure the phrase observational eros is quite right, even as it gestures towards something essential, since observation is so closely associated with the kind of neoliberal logic Sodell is writing explicitly against, scientific, clinical, managerial, and so on. In its place, I would simply offer attentional eros, at least as a companion placeholder, until we can better name the kind of being with or existential care that we need to rediscover or recreate after the cataclysm of values, values that has begun with colonial modernity and accelerated beyond belief since the 1980s. So in the interest of promoting a new collective libidinal ecology, both intentional and attentional, 
I now turn to a specific, highly immersive and somewhat participatory instance of, of this attentional eros, namely surfing. So um, this is part two now, where I'm gonna preview, I just finished a manuscript simply called Paying Attention. It's the first book where I just cannot even think of a pun. It's just it's very paying attention because that's all it is really. Um, 30 portraits. So I write, I've written 30 little sketches about different ways of paying attention according to the premise that you are how you pay attention and, and what you pay attention to. So there's examples like the parent, um, the doctor, the hypochondriac, uh, the journalist, the tin pusher, uh, the ball boy, and even the surveillance camera, the self-driving car, the virus, etc. cetera. So um, I thought I would go for the surfer today because um, maybe because it seems one of the most obviously ecological. So what I'm gonna do is you've looked at my mug long enough. So I'm gonna share the screen and play you some um, blissful surfing images for those who are longing for summer. And I'll just be a voiceover now and um, hopefully just listening and not looking at me will help with the whole attentional process. So share screen, optimize for video clip. Don't start. Okay, I'm in. Oh, go away. Go away. <laughs> There's nothing moving. Oh, I can go here. The surfer. <clears throat> Some water. The surfer pays attention to the fluxing undulations of the ocean. In doing so, her attention is not taken up with a single object, the ocean, but the specific way, sometimes chaotic, sometimes highly patterned, in which this great element refracts into a series of approaching waves, each distinct from the last. At a glance from the sand, the experienced surfer can glean a good sense of the tide, current, swell, an overall mood of Neptune's playground. It is not until she is in the sea itself, however, that she is really immersed in the liquid grain of the water, which can change at any moment. The surfer instinctively understands Heraclitus's famous statement that one can never step into the same stream twice. In her case, however, she lives with this flowing truism, with the infinitely more complex dynamics of the sea. The surfer thus watches the surface, sometimes churning, other times as smooth as glass, with the intense focus of a child, forever hopeful that the mood of Mother Ocean will be in harmony with the serious business of the day, play. We might even go so far as to say that the surfer turns the sober act of land surveying into a sport by adapting every cell of her body, every fiber of her being to the far more treacherous topography of water. Here she guides her beloved surfboard at such times an extension of herself to glide over the lay of the land. In this altogether more challenging element in which any given angle or orientation lasts a split second, she is in a heightened state of awareness, anticipating the shapes and curves to come. The skateboarder, by contrast in an unconscious homage to the arc of evolution, brings the board onto terra firma adds some wheels and then surfs the frozen waves of concrete and steel. Beyond the immediacy of the oncoming breakers, the surfer must also clock the overall environment, including the weather, especially any approaching storms that might whip up the tide, other surfers, especially any aggressive or inexperienced interlopers, and other potentially hazardous elements, such as submerged rocks or coral. The main motivation, however, for leaving the security of the shore and paddling out towards the surf is to taste that almost religious feeling when things go well. At such times, the surfer controls the wave like a rodeo champion, but at the same time, she suddenly feels completely at one with its curling, surging intensity. 
in the midst of the perfect ride, or even in a few seconds of an imperfect one, the surfer thus simultaneously dominates and melts into the infinite dissolving power of the ocean. It is a sensation at once clarifying and absolving, reinforcing and releasing, transcendent and deeply imminent. And it is one of the most addictive sensations one can experience. Hence those circulating tales of successful business people who, after getting a taste of the surfing life, give up everything to chase the perfect wave for the rest of their lives. The surfer is thus yet another one of these paradoxical figures of attention, both highly focused, only the wave really matters, and highly distracted, since 99% of her life is spent dealing with things that are, alas, not the perfect wave, and thus difficult to really commit to. For our purposes, the surfer can be contrasted with the tracker, who builds up a picture in her mind of recent events by paying careful att attention to the indexical traces in the environment, those being actual impressions, marks or traces of previous entities or events such as footprints in the snow or bullet holes in a wall. The tracker can therefore identify and reconstruct significant passages through the fourth dimension, i.e. time, and the way these specific strands or notable threads weave their way through the three dimensions of space. For instance, a tracker might say, a wombat came through this part of the bush this morning since these droppings are cube shaped and not yet dry. The surfer, however, is not concerned with anything but the present moment. Even the previous wave that passed by a matter of seconds ago is expunged swiftly from consciousness as she scans the horizon for gathering signs of the next one. The tracker, like the detective, can reconstruct the past in order to make decisions or judgments in the present mindful of tomorrow. The surfer, by contrast, is suspended in the here and now as the vectors of undulating actuality lift her up into the rolling foam of the immediate future. Like a melody, the attention of the surfer is involved in Henri Bergson's key notion of durée, a term coined to describe that philosopher's belief the time flows organically and smoothly from one state to the other, rather than stochastically passing an invisible baton between a temporally distinct past, present, then future. Time for the surfer washes around her body, rippling outwards. It does not pass by in linear fashion, or if it does, the linearity is itself tubular. The only time the present is rather violently ruptured from the future is when the surfer is unceremoniously dumped deep beneath the churning surface. Then her whole being goes into emergency mode, concentrated on the task of holding her breath for as long as it takes to resurface safely. The exhilaration of sparring with such a formidable opponent means that the surfer is surfing as much on adrenaline as salt water. Beyond the metaphysics of the thing, the surfer is a sociological, even anthropological type. She tends to represent a certain subculture, aesthetic, or lifestyle. The beach bum, the hippie, the dude, or dudette. As such, she tends to favor the organic, the countercultural, the THC-infused, and the patchouli-scented. Or at least that's the popular stereotype. Her hair is dreadlocked from the salt, her clothes utilitarian and unpretentious, and her feet prefer to be unshod. When not actively surfing, she is waxing her board, talking to other surfers about undiscovered beaches, and thinking about how she can continue to tweak her life to maximize the chance of finding the perfect wave. Her attention ecology is thus an idealized alternative to the daily grind, a utopian option to opt out of the rat race. We are all at some point dream of dropping out and trying our luck with the oceanic gods, perhaps unconsciously inspired by watching Gidget movies or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The surfer is the very embodiment of the optimist, since no matter how crappy the conditions, the perfect wave still beckons elsewhere or else when, and she will do almost anything to keep chasing it. Surfing is thus a wholesome form of addiction with no harmful side effects to really speak of except minor rashes, ear infections, sunburn, and the very occasional shark bite. The surfer comes closer to most to being in harmony with the elements in their natural frequencies. And when she closes her eyes at night, she can still see and feel the swell continuing to approach her, 
lifting her up and laying her down. Perhaps even her own somatic cycle is synchronized with the phases of the moon, which in turn directly affect the size and rhythm of the tides. It is amusing then to look back on the mid 1990s when everyone was exciting, excited about surfing the web and so distracted by chat rooms and pixelated skin that we didn't even notice this strange mixed metaphor. Through the force of analogy, the internet was presented as a vast ocean of information to which anyone with a modem could paddle and surf at will and according to their whim. Indeed, one of the first internet browsers was called Netscape Navigator and branded itself with the logo of a ship's wheel. And while it's true that the first few years of being online could provide moments of serotonin or even adrenaline via the futuristic novelty of communicating with people in real time on the other side of the world, this type of surfing would, over time, deliver diminishing returns and lose its aquatic associations altogether. Still suggestive, however, is the fact that these two types of surfing are strongly connected in the popular mind with the idea of the California dream, where a successful Silicon Valley CEO can take a meeting barefoot on his Instagrammable veranda and then surf the waves in his state of art wetsuit before driving to a sports car to a business lunch in Santa Cruz. As Don DeLillo put it so well, Californians invented the idea of lifestyle and this alone warrants their doom. <clears throat> Excuse me. The enduring appeal of surfing itself or the figure of the surfer and popular culture has its roots in the aforementioned quasi-religious aspect of the practice. Surfing is alluring precisely because it does not leave anything in its wake, it does not produce anything other than euphoria on a good day or the determination to do better next time when the elements conspire against her. In his attempt to describe the indescribable, Immanuel Kant resorted to the experience one might have when facing a giant looming mountain in the Alps. The sublime, he argued, refuses to be put into words. We can only feel it in our own impotent and insignificance. We can only point to it off stage, as it were, or point to the extraordinary things, usually natural or artistic, that evoke a sense of the sublime in us, while not exactly embodying. For the sublime sublimates itself as we try to approach or grab hold. It evaporates into the unaccountable ether of the numinous. One wonders what Kant would have made of surfing had such a pastime been invented in his time. After all, the surfer's attention is uniquely concerned with getting as close as she can to the sublime. Indeed, she is granted a special proximity to it by virtue of her renunciation of the desire to grasp it, to clutch it close. Rather, she is content to simply ride along with it for the fleeting duration of a wave, vibing with its primal momentum as it dances toward the shore, gliding on the cusp of collapse and dissolution. To see those enormous waves off the coast of Hawaii as a tropical storm approaches, to watch the surfer ride that fine line between living life to the fullest and surrendering to the death drive is to feel an inkling of the lurching vertigo of the sublime. To stand on the shore and witness these foolish, courageous souls as to stand, like Kant, in front of a monstrous mountain. On this occasion, however, the mountain is now unaccountably rushing toward us. To be the surfer herself, however, riding the giant cliff face of crystal, is to pay profound attention to every micro moment that separates ecstasy and agony. And yet she's so imbricated in the moment that the experience feels less like a triumph or accomplishment than an absolute release or letting go, mentally, spiritually, even as every muscle tenses in the white knuckle struggle against catastrophe. When she finally finds and rides the perfect wave, the surfer is no longer registering the world in the quotidian currency of attention. For she is, for those few eternal seconds, of a peace and at peace with the world itself. So deeply and fully present, that there is no longer any distance, no more space of reflection from which to measure the quality or span of attention at all. Boom. Boom. Okay. So, I guess that's that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dominique. Wonderful.
Beautiful, intimate, bleak, humorous, and warm. Thank you. Wow. I, I kind of um, realized that my penchant for watching surfing um, clips on Red Bull TV doesn't do it for me, but when you slow down those um, images, the body really feels the wave and the ecology far more that you were talking about. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dominique has uh, agreed to answer some questions. Um, so uh, if you could indicate to Carolyn or Timothy, um, they will unmute you and um, um, please, questions. Thank you again, Dominique. No one jumping at the opportunity. Carolyn, is anyone indicating a question? Uh, not to me so far. Uh... Um, I also take objections and suggestions. Uh, um, oh, Lisbeth uh, and Yas. Yeah. Well, it's maybe not really a question, but so, some sort of half bred thought, I would say. And that started. I started thinking about about, about this when you were when you were starting off your talk, which was really great. And also part two, I really loved, you know, <laughs> really, really beautiful. Um, I was thinking of um, a text that I've, I have um, uh, read, um, which dealt with the revolution uh, in South Korea at uh, the, the 1980s uh, Kwangju uprising. And there's a text that describes um, uh, maybe in similar terms uh, the uprising with um, uh, making a connection to time, love, and eros. Uh, also stating, let's say, and, and that's also why, why I thought that your second part of the lecture was also really interesting because there you have the surfing where the body is being lifted by the waves, no? And I sort of also was thinking with this kind of revolutionary um, uh, force in mind, um, uh, where the mass or where the body is being lifted by the mass of people that are with you in that same moment of caring for perhaps a change, no? And what I really um, uh, thought about uh, this kind of similarities is the temporarity of this movement. We cannot forever be in a revolution. We can also not forever be in the wave, no? There's this kind of uh, ups and downs, literally, no? We have to let go and then uh, grab ourselves again. And then I was thinking with regards to um, uh, what you mentioned at some point, the industrialization of time to make time and love, therefore also more and more efficient. Um, uh, my question would perhaps be in a time like this, and I'm also thinking of Sikoti Park, um, in a time like this, would a revolution that is really, let's say, lifting the crowd uh, still be possible? And I'm not thinking of the truck drivers in Ottawa. Wow, there's so uh, lots of elements there. Um, thank you. I mean, there's, I mean, there is a certain shorthand for Eros, which could be seen as political potential of belonging or togetherness more than more than the self and uh, optimistically I did read say the uprisings in the streets in the middle of 2021 at the height of COVID in the U.S. around Black Lives Matter as um, as perhaps wouldn't have happened if we weren't all in lockdown and thus hyper-synchronized in a certain way. So we, it, it, there was a suddenly this new sharing of temporality or attention, like public attention, um, which spilled over into the streets because before that, of course, we were all kept saying, why, why aren't we in the streets? Why, why isn't there direct action happening since Sukhati Park and even when people are being executed? Um, so I don't think it was a coincidence that it finally boiled over in the middle of 2020. One, um, but of course that's a different affect. It's not, 
it wasn't um, eros in that sense. What you're making me think is uh, the way that the, the wave or the revolution can't last, it's almost like it's an event. It, it makes me think Badiou needs to come up with another form of event beyond art or beyond love or beyond politics <laughs> or something something that that like you say um can extend because surfing i don't think is just aesthetic i don't think it's it's not revolutionary but there's something it, it's something um vital and essential and interesting about it even if it's just as a figure so um, it doesn't have to be literalized um, so it is this perfect wave motif that I had in the in the in the piece. It could stand for that kind of thing. It could stand for um, how do you again back to the sustainability question around love and um, time and relationships, even just on a banal, banal level. How do you? What is the? What is the rhythm here? What is the temporality? How do you sustain something that's not built to be sustained? But maybe how do you ride those troughs and things? I, I did have that quote from Roland Barthes, um, how power always installs a rhythm. And his, his counter to that is what he calls idiorhythmy. So a kind of uh, idiocentric type of rhythm that, that goes tangential to power or diagonal to power. And I mean, surfing in some ways is like that, although it's easily co-opted co -opted, as I suggested by the California ideology. So. I agree, there's a, there's a lot going on here. I don't know how to pull all the threads together neatly just in this moment, but um, I think it's helpful for, for, you, for, for me to get those extra coordinates in there. Thank you. Carolyn, um, is there some chat uh, yeah. thread questions? And Ania has a question next, actually. I have a question. Uh, good evening. Hello, Dominic. It's so good to see you. Hi, Anya. I hope that you can hear me well. I have a question about like about Manusha, but Manusha like tends to grow in my mind. Um, before you played the beautiful images of uh, the footage of of waves, um, you mentioned it could perhaps help us or save us from from distraction in your book you mm, might be writing, must be writing about distraction. And my question is, do you find people, humans, distracting for one another? Because when you, when you said about like, you know, saving us from distraction or like helping us to, to focus better on, on like your, um, your, your, your like second part of your speech, you mentioned like your face. So immediately I thought perhaps like you write something about like, people being distracting for one another. My claim is that we find one another exhausting for love exchanges. That's why we tend to like, you know, shun um, interhuman intimacy and just like move forward to human, non-human intimacy. So mm -hmm. could you answer this question in relation to your forthcoming book? I'm super curious. Yeah, no, thank you, Anya. It's funny, I just taught when the machine stops yesterday, uh, the E.M. Forster short story, which is almost like an Edwardian matrix. And I wasn't ready for the students to feel upset that the machine was stopped, actually. They, they, were, they read the machine as comforting, amniotic was the term. And um, obviously this, didn't, this is a new kind of emergence of equating our isolation, equating our alienation with a kind of comfortable numbness. Um, actually, Steve's here, I know you've talked about that, how you've made peace with a certain um, kind of matrix type existence, might want to chime in. But um, so it's, it's hard because you don't want to be normative and moralistic about, oh, you're just at home. You're not, you don't have enough social commerce um, and that's just bad to core because obviously there's such a thing as too much attention. Anyone who's had a stalker is like, there's such a thing as too much attention. So it's not attention, good, distraction, bad, which is part of the infinite distraction argument. But um, 
finding the right well with everything right it's about finding the right balance so it's like knowing when when distraction you know it's helpful useful even pleasant and when um kind of like with surfing you're not always surfing but if you have one hour a day this is why people meditate obviously and or their equivalents it's like how do you genuinely pay attention to attention itself that meta level is what's important because that's how you build certain muscles of um those muscles that push against what heidegger called the forgetting of being right so i think there's too much we do forget being too easily and we like forgetting being because being hurts and it's and it's and is exhausting so um we certainly do pref we seem to be moving historically into this preference for uh, mediated intimacies, non-human intimacies. And I'm the last to say that's bad and we should get back to organic human love, obviously. But um, I do, th we don't want to throw out, that's not the right metaphor, but we do, I, I think we don't want to reboot completely. I think there are certain practices, even just being in a band together in the same room, is a form of eros right you're playing music together and that type of resonance machine is different and 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 kind of more sustaining than um if you're just always in the bedroom with your sequencer or whatever making beats so it's not about one's bad or the other but about that thinking of it as an ecology and and and, and treating it ecologically um which includes things like balance homeostasis <laughs> various cycles you know that takes time into account so that um you have certain moments of release and tension and all of that i was thinking you know about the surfer's bliss if i may like ask a follow-up question um that you know it's like um to have like comfort of attention like or just kind of you know the balance between distraction and attention it's this dynamic is like you know almost like rendering onto caesar's what caesar what onto, onto caesar what caesar's because like you know the surfer he needs to like you know leave the beach and go back to the corporate context maybe to just kind of then be able to earn money for the luxury of surfing um, i was thinking yes so right. yeah just trying to be provocative <laughs> here um yeah. Would you say is it is it like a new luxury? Is it like the like an economy of? Oh, of, you mean of, of this this praxis, this type of practice? Yeah. Um. I mean, I yeah, I think I did signal that at the beginning. There's this huge disconnect between those who have the luxury of time and those who don't. Yeah. Um. But that's one of the unsustainable things about the age, and I, I so I don't think obviously you don't need. Uh, money to practice it you can know you, you can gather in groups and watch a show or create something um but the conditions are such that it's especially since covid and especially in the us where there's absolutely no sense of arts funding or you know things like that that it's uh it's particularly difficult so i think back to revolution maybe like uh, that how long can this go on where people are so uh so disoriented so alienated from from anything vital that they that they just stop and so that's almost the way the the great resignation is being framed all these people quitting their jobs it's like um realizing that there's there is more to life um than a less than minimum wage existence but there's also the sense that it's it is if it's obviously much easier for um affluent people to be ludic and and do all these things that uh, we think the rest of the planet should be enjoying thank you so much beautiful talk thank you carolyn Peace. Other... Uh, has a virtual hand up, I think. Okay. 
Thank you, Dominic. That was so beautiful. Um, you you gave us a, a a really interesting challenge when you when you suggested that maybe attention was not the term that that was that that you weren't sure what kind of language um, would frame this this work and. I was thinking when you were speaking about um, about the difference between a kind of focal attention and a kind of um, you could say I don't know I don't want to say distributed because it has history but you know I'm thinking of an attention that is that is not focal and I think in the surfer example that wouldn't uh, at least it would carry between those two modes of attention you have a kind of peripheral attention that is that is very um, alive and and then you have a, a you know a, a focal attention as well that has to do with maintaining uh, your 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 direction or, or whatever and the reason I'm, I'm thinking about that is is that um as as somebody who's been always very concerned and 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 engaged with neurodiversity focal attention is not the most typical form of attention in my surrounds um and i've heard um and and i guess what i what i'm wanting to think or to hear from you is in your examples did you find that you were that that the term attention was 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 a struggle, um, and I guess the the reason I'm asking is that um, a lot of the folks that I work with have been accused their whole life of having a troubled mode of attention, of not living up to attention in in the proper ways of um, attending wrong, of being attuned to the wrong things and so on. So mm. anyway, I was just curious how that played out in your work. Oh, yes, thanks, Erin. Um, yes, it's, it's, even the term distraction is heavily loaded because if we accuse someone of being distracted, it just means often they're paying attention to something else or something we don't want them to. So um, there are two sides of the same coin in many ways. Also the distinction between focal and maybe less focal attention could be something also correlates to like a kind of cognitive attention, not necessarily, but they could be just, you know, focusing on your studies or whatever versus the multi-sensual one of, of surfing where often you have to defocus in order to do it well. But in terms of um, uh, not neurotypical folks who are being uh, given all sorts of clinical names, um, I don't know if you know Pooja Rangan's work. She has a lovely um, book on some of this, on different ways of presenting that, that sensorium as a mode of attention. Um, It's 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 phenomenal. It comes down to phenomenology, <laughs> in, again, in a way. The uh, someone's we can't assume what another person's um, umwelt is, and that's why even when there is there's always mediation between us because you can't. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but even direct conversation is could be a, I, one of my students is heavily synesthesiac at the moment so like i'll be just saying something and colors are flying at her or you know it's it's um the sensorium is there's so many filters of experience and then then the attempt to narrate that experience for another that means yeah i i any form of it's like a game of telephone, any form of sharing, being with. So the being with, and that's what makes it interesting because if we all were just a Borg and hooked up to the same nervous system, there'd be no art, there'd be no conversation, there'd be no 
agreement or disagreement. So I think it's um, uh, we're only just starting to really honor and um, promote and, and encourage the type of umwelt sharing that doesn't fit these these very strict grids that have to do with discipline and to do with self-management or self-expression according to overdetermined codes. So um, the, the example Pooja gives are documentaries by people who've been diagnosed as autistic. Um, so what does it mean to give a voice to somebody who doesn't want to, to give your own self a voice when you're not really talking about literally the larynx, but about share like trying to represent i guess the loaded word but trying to represent your own umwelt um, in a way that makes some kind of sense it's a translation exercise in many ways and that's that's what's that's part of the vital thing of being alive it, it not just between humans but between creatures between machines and people that's where the interest lies so thank you <laughs> Uh, and I see Wanda has a um, virtual raised hand as well, so I'll unmute you. Okay. Yes, Dominic, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And I actually would like to come back. Yeah, sorry. It more connects to the previous question. Um, I want to come back to the footage of the wave, um, the surfer. And I have to say that I was actually pretty disturbed by it. So you put it on as a distraction. And uh, indeed, the, at the very beginning, I was mesmerized and it worked. But then the longer it went on, I start thinking, yeah, but this is not about wave. This is not about the surfer. We have, we have a camera here. Where is the camera? What is the technology, the video technology doing? Uh, we need waterproof cameras. The beauty of you know capturing the eye of of, of the of the waves, so the, ca the camera eye with the eye of the waves. So I started looking at all these things, and I and I and and maybe that that connects somehow to this wonderful notion that you well you didn't really develop, but I'm more interested in is love as a palimpsest where of course, I think it's also about all these different layers of technology. And, and I was wondering if we can have a love a relation, for instance, with elements of nature, which would be the surfer with the wave, where there is no technology or not, well, technology in, even in, um, in um, low tech sense of you know, medi medi mediation as you, um, mentioned like language and so on so and 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 i've also seen this somehow also connects back to you know the pandemic i've seen so many people going back to nature or this need to go back to nature this love for nature for trees people embracing trees and so on so i'm yeah all different uh, things i don't know if they're connected but it's really this mm this this um is there a way we can do without technology and would that be a, a solution to the problem that you are you know raising here uh, so you're almost talking about the paradox of uh the reason nature looks so gorgeous in those images is because it's so they're so technological they're so uh, mediate in a way Yes, but I, I, no, I think it's more like when you, of course, you're trying to, you were trying to evoke the relation between the surfer and the wave, mm -hmm. right, which is, um, I would say, is a, it's, it's a relationship, a very direct relationship where, right, right, you know, right. there would no, ideally be no technology, of course, you have to board, yeah. you have you a lot of equipment. Yes. But it would be like a direct, like nature, human yeah. body relationship. But while watching the the footage, I could not get into that mood, or, or I got uh, kind of um, 
It kind of disrupted. So at first it worked, but then it got disrupted, but also probably of the Zoom delay and the the footage footage stopped. And I got so aware of the technology, of the video technology, of the Zoom technology, that it didn't work anymore, you know? So that's what was the the disruption, I would say, or or the, this, yeah. I do, there's a footnote I didn't read, which was about the erotics of surfing. And how eros does not need to be, you know, sexy. It doesn't have to be people, naked people, or what have you. It, it like eros can be ecological. It can be sensual. It, 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 it's about a kind of passion or love for for being alive. Um, it might even be a form of what Lacan calls ecstasy. So not the intimacy of of intersubjective relationships, but the more abstract and uh, um, kind of atmospheric forms. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. There's a there's a neo-Luddite movement brooding, which makes sense given just how t- tired we can be with the unmediated um, or the overmediated. Uh, we we well, we haven't just forgot being. We've forgotten our creatureliness. Is one of my themes. Is that again? I mentioned how we're mammals and touch is is so important for mood and like all sorts of hormones and um. So surfing is a bit like love making in terms of <laughs> it's 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 not a focused activity of attention or at least. It doesn't have to be. It's it's more like a release. It's more like a, a sort of letting go of humanness that I that I think is is part of its seduction or pleasures. Like when you're surfing, you you become almost elemental. You sort of become the board, and human concerns are let let go of. Just as good lovemaking can have a, an analog to that. It's it's less a kind of performance or um, accomplishment. It's, it's more a relinquishing or a letting go or a, a sort of, um, yeah, it's almost like a, an exhalation after 10 years of holding this one's breath, which the, the, the burden of being a subject, of being coherent, of being a self through time. Um, you know, it, back in the 90s, you know, Bersani and others always talked about sex as why it was so seductive is because it shatters your coherence and your, the architecture of the self. And um, maybe something like surfing or meditation, hugging trees, they're all ways of getting, they're, they're kind of refusals or, or attempts to escape. Um, being nailed down to, to the limits of the subject. Mm-hmm. Be my on the cuff answer. Um, yes, which, which somehow is getting away of technology or not necessarily um I, not necessarily no i don't no. Think, I, I think you know some of the are like musical instruments and there are other ways to to use technology to mm-hmm. bring these states into being drugs <laughs> you know um it's it's not an anti-technology thing but it's an anti um Maybe it's an anti. No, I, I don't want to even go there. But it's it's about looking at the, the all the elements and take making sort of holistic decisions about the ecology of the experience. Like who's who's being included, why, who's not, why, how, all those kind of questions. Um, just to, just to sort of it's just a plea to kind of expand the to not think in terms of just libidinal economy like we used to, but to like a lot of people these days, reminding ourselves like Guattari that there's different ecologies. There's the ecology of the self, of the society, of the world, and, and being mindful of all of those at the same time might give us better perspectives because we get caught in our own psychological self-labelings and or our status as social subjects. Um, or then just suddenly get overwhelmed as sort of the victor, like a, a, a pawn in the massive systems like climate change. There's, there's got to be somewhere in between those where we can navigate a bit more, uh, with a bit more 
uh, I don't know, confidence, panache, or less angst anyway, um, where we can feel like citizens of the world without, or citizens of the planet without um, being either overwhelmed or grief stricken, or on the other hand, narcissistic and anthropocentric and megalomaniac. No, you're trying to be optimistic, right? Always, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Actually, not always. I'm often accused of being the Adorno in the room, but today I'm feeling like I might as well. Are there we any have, oh yeah, we do have quite a few questions in the chat, actually. Um, if you would be willing to entertain a couple of them, Dominic. Sure, sure, sure. All right. Uh, the first. Been... Oh. <laughs> I haven't been looking, sorry. <laughs> um, the first one uh, from Shannon on uh, whether the other 29 portraits in the book constitute a typology of forms of attention. Um, thanks, Shannon. Let me quickly try and bring it up to remind myself. Uh, documents, manuscripts, paying attention. Um, a typ typology or topology? I guess. Sorry, a typology of forms of it. Um, it is, uh, I mean, there are figures that I felt um, crystallized or embodied, uh, part particularly, I don't know, revealing or suggestive or um, typical types of attention. Um, almost allegorical. So I've got here, yes, the parent, the doctor, the, the hypochondriac, the detective and the lovers. And, and, and they're also designed to be talking to each other. So often like a jealous lover can suddenly act much more like a detective than a generous lover, for instance. So it, it, it's an attempt to show, again, it's a very complex Venn diagram where a fan is also a lover, is also a detective. Um, to what extent is a gourmand also a, a student or a voyeur? Um, so it's, 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 they're a bit like chess pieces in that they represent a certain type of attention, but it's also, again, this attempt to see it ecologically as one day, even a doctor can be a hypochondriac, right? So it's, it's, it's not about these are certain, like people are completely uh, saturated by their, their single lens, but that, uh, you know, you could be a factory worker and an influencer in your spare time. So the typology is somewhat contingent, just the one, just examples I thought would be the most fun to explore. Like, I don't know anything about being a tin pusher, for instance, like the helping land airplanes. But to me, I chose that because it's the most focused you can be, right? Your brain really is, it, talk about focal attention, you're landing planes at JFK every few seconds versus say the masseur, where it's much more sensual and you're paying attention to someone else's body, almost like a human map and you find out where their traumas are by feel or their, or their, you know, you can almost make a portrait of somebody's life just by giving them a massage. Um, so that was the idea behind it. it. It was inspired partly by a book that's inspired me before, uh, Flusser's Gestures, where he goes through a list of a typology of gestures. So this is the same spirit. Is, is in this book. So um, interestingly, it's been harder to place because it's a bit more playful, I suppose. And, and not it's sort of neither fish nor fowl. It's not academic, but it's also not just purely literary. So it's going to be interesting to see where it ends up because it's, um, you know, people still like these clear categories, no matter the whole, <laughs> especially when it comes to selling books. Right. Um, and then there's a question from um, Simone saying, just a side remark, 
presenting uh, most likely the overtly obvious, I am wondering about questions between your art of attention and the stoic concept um, of, uh, sorry, I'm losing the thread here. And the stoic concept of, I'm afraid I actually don't know how to pronounce this word. Um, Prasash. Prasash and, Prasash and Hedos, um, mm. and subsequently, for instance, Adam Roberts, beside you, um, interest in ascesis as the part, as the art of directing your attention and perception. Is Simone still here? Uh, I'm afraid she had to leave. I can send you. Yeah, uh, I can send <laughs> because you. Because I was going to say I, I might need some help in contextualizing that because that's I'm blinded by science there. <laughs> um, I, I'm not as familiar with those, with that, with that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, perhaps I can have a follow up with Simone through email or something. Great. Um, maybe I could interject. I think it's from um, Oliver Botar. Um, could you distinguish between mediated attention and unmediated attention? Is it a different type of attention? Is it a different mm -hmm. practice? You mentioned Pauline Oliveros, whose musical practice is rooted in part in the Zen Buddhist practice of deep attention to one's surroundings. But if I'm immersed in a movie on Netflix, isn't that a similar kind of to total attention? I, it's kind of um, circling around some of the ideas you've talked about, but... Um, um, Unmediated, yeah. mediated. Yeah, again, I'm not just saying mediated, bad, unmediated, good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Um, and yes, you could be sitting, what you could be watching a pretty mediocre sunset <laughs> from in, in somewhere uh, in, in the middle of nowhere and wouldn't be nearly as impressive as an IMAX experience about the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think there are, I mean, it's just, it, it, I just think it's important to register the, the degrees of and the levels of. Um, there's a group that I talk about in the introduction to my, actually it's how Shep and I first met the, the, the birds, um, the order of the third bird, our group, global group, committed to um, sustaining collective acts of attention in person. This is, um, and they've been trying to replicate it through Zoom since COVID, but there, it's just a different quality of, um, you know, it's different if you're all in a room together, paying attention to the same object without speaking, which is one of their practices. That's a different experience to, everyone being on Zoom, looking at the same photo, obviously. So it's more about paying attention to the affordances of any occasion or environment and, and, and what they allow and what they don't and what they foreclose and what they encourage uh, than making good, bad judgments. It's, it's about, again, I mean, I'm sure if I would surf, if I became an actual surfer, I would, I would crave you know, um, Netflix or something, you know, I would crave um, recorded music and, and, and mediated pleasures. So it's, it's, some would probably just love the, living the authentic um, life of a, mo of a nomad monad <laughs> um, out in nature, but that's the whole point of the Anthropocene, right? Is, is that nature is, I, I agree with Timothy Morton to the extent that we should be talking more in terms of ecology than nature these days, given how much you can go to the bottom of the ocean and find plastics and everything. So it's not either or, obviously, these days. But, um, and, and as we were also suggesting, you could be still even in the same room with someone. It doesn't mean it's not mediated by social conventions and protocols and assumptions and brain wiring and chemicals and moods and so everything is always mediated when it comes to humans um, especially because we're so neurotic and have so many <laughs> grids of perception that we've both been born with and, and learn later so um, 
I think it's more a how than a than a why question for me. Thanks, Dominic. I guess mm -hmm. kind of it's an of an at least equal um, status or value in this sense. I and I I think I I learned that from you. I might even not be so irritated when my daughter has her Instagram on <laughs> <laughs> because there must be some kind of attentional um, positivity in that, in spite of the the corporate interests and and I, you know it's like mm, maybe right. If, what do you think? Or is that going too far? Uh, well, I do, I mean, I, I do, I'm sympathetic with the critiques of especially, you know, Silicon Valley because they weaponize the tension and they're so good okay. at making it addictive that that's why I think we need these other forms. It's not to say unmediated, but like taking a bit more control over, because, you know, the, the like button and the notification buttons, they figured it out neurologically what triggers us and things so it's a pretty deep sophisticated mm -hmm. hijacking of our of our minds so i do think that we need to unprogram that quite a bit even just the scrolling the, the genius of the scroll mm -hmm. the haptics of it um is too seductive i i do think that so it's not like i'm taking out any critique but um I find it myself, you know, I, I make a living critiquing social media. I spend 10 hours a day on social media, so I don't know. It's, what can I say? <laughs> They're very good at what they do, but also they are taking advantage of things that are vital to us, like, mm -hmm. you know, exchange and sharing and being together, so. Dominique, um, I think we've... Um, we, we've I think taken we've reached our attention time. span. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we've taken so much of your time and very generous of you to speak with us so long. Um, thank you very much. Oh, for I appreciate us. everyone listening and being here. And thanks so much.